loves, my name is Hannah and welcome to my June wrap up. Had a bloody lovely time with my reading in June, let's get into it. I'm going to start with some stats and then we're going to go into the books. So I read 14 books this month, um, which I am happy with. I still think it's too many. I still think I need to read a bit less, but I have narrowly by the skin of my teeth avoided having 15 books again for four months in a row, which would have just really really annoyed me. So um, we're happy with 14. We're happy it's not 15. In terms of the format, I read actually weirdly nearly half of them were hardbacks. So six of them were hardbacks. That is more hardbacks in a month than I have read in a very long time, possibly ever. I am paperback girly, which is why I spend most of my time living in the backlists because hardback books annoy me. Um, but I read six of them this month, never mind. Um, and then I read two paperbacks, five audiobooks, and one ebook. Genres, pretty, pretty mixed bag this month, but also pretty standard for me. So, um, five literary, and this is with the usual disclaimers about genre, right? Like, most books are multiple genres, it's very hard to just pick the one thing that it is. So, I've gone with five literary, three memoir, two crime, two classics, one poetry, one non-fiction that isn't a memoir. So then talking length, I read the average page number was 259, which again, I think is why it's still more books than I would expect or would necessarily want it to be. I really like a longer book. I don't know why I haven't been picking them up. Well, I've had... I do know why I haven't been picking them up. It's because of this bloody Euros challenge, but that is done, finished. Um, so I'm looking forward over the summer to getting into some chunkier books. And in fact, I've already started getting into some chunkier books. So yeah, average page was 259. Biggest book I read was 334 pages, so not very big at all. And the shortest was 114. Um, audiobooks, again, pretty similar. Like average was seven hours. I think that's quite... That's on the short side, I would say, for audiobooks. I really like like a 10 hour audiobook. I like to like get stuck in and ones that are too short, I find like I get a bit all over the place with. So like the shortest one that I read this month was a hundred, an hour 48. And that was just like so, so fast. I was barely, I was barely paying attention. Um, so <laughs> we'll get to that. And the longest one was just under 11 hours. So yeah, I will kind of want to get to, if you've got any good like audiobook recommendations, that's not like too plotty in terms of like lots of like strands that you need to remember, but it's like a good long story. Let me know. Cause like I really enjoyed Tom Lake was good for that. I'm currently listening to The Mercies by Kieran Millwood, Millwood Hargrave, which is a, a good one because it's not a very big cast but it's like a nice story. Do you... Give me your audiobook recommendations, guys. I don't know how else to ask. And then in my last wrap up, I, I told you that I, I also track the, how long each book takes me to read because I am a multi-book reader. So it's not like I'm reading one book, closing it, reading the next book, closing it. I normally have like four or five on the go at any time. So while I've read 14 books this month, that is not me reading a book every couple of days. On average, it took me seven and a half days to finish a book. The quickest book I read in two days and the longest took me 15 days, but that was nonfiction. So, um, and then final little bit, uh, two, just two translated books this month, the last two for the Euros thing. And then I think I've given myself like a bit of a break of a break from the translated fiction. If you've just landed on my page and you don't know what I'm talking about by the Euros, by the way, I will link below what I'm talking about when I talk about the Euros reading challenge. It's just been a lot of translated literature, um, more than I, much more than I normally read, which I have enjoyed, but I, I also kind of want to park that for a minute. So only two, um, two translated books. But eight of the 14 books I read were queer, so that's nice for Pride Month. I mean, I'm all for reading queer books every month of the year, but I was I was making like a bit more of a conscious effort to like really read more queer stuff in June. But um, 
that's just because I like gay things, so. Um, and then three of the books I read were by authors of colour, so I spoke last month about how I'm not very happy with that number. Um, I have plans of it. I'm, it's good. The reason I love doing stuff like this where you actually sit and look at the stats kind of like more month by month rather than just waiting for like a big mid-year check-in, which I'm doing later this week, or like end of the year stuff is like, it, I want to be able to course correct over the course of the year, you know what I mean? Where like, I'm noticing things about my reading and going, ooh, not reading very much from this space, not reading much of this thing that I really like. Like, um, I haven't read much poetry over the last couple of months, having rediscovered my love for poetry about three months ago, and then very promptly <laughs> forgetting about it again. So, we persevere. Anyway, those were just some statsy bits. Um, and now I will talk to you. I will talk to you about the books. I'm going to start, as I tend to with these wrap-ups, talking to you about books that you might have already heard me talking about on this channel before, so you can skip ahead if you don't care to hear me talk about the same book multiple times. Um, but I... Future Hannah's normally very helpful and puts chapter markers in, so you can just like skippity skip skip a few if you, uh, if you want to. Um, so, the first book I'm going to talk about is the book that I read for Slovenia for the Euros Challenge. This was Blind Man by Mitya Kande and was translated from the Slovenian by Rawley Graw. And this is a sort of... It's sort of political satire meets bureaucratic farce. Um, and it's about a book editor who is struggling, internally struggling, with the loss of his eyesight. Um, he's had really poor vision his entire life and has always just sort of like tried to ignore that, desperately doesn't want to be thought of as a blind person. So there's, there's things happening there with his character. And um, he sort of becomes, in, he, he gets brought in to form like essentially like a new ministry of culture in the government and it's a bit it's kind of it's funny because parts of it I felt like were quite slapstick but I also I also just wondered because um there were probably a lot of like cultural touchstones that a Slovenian audience would understand that I wasn't understanding and so I sometimes wondered if like some of the things that felt silly were actually much more loaded but I wasn't able to access the load if that makes sense um I thought it was I thought it was fine I was a bit antsy going into to this one um I just I needed a book for Slovenia that was available to me freely that I wasn't gonna have to like purchase and this was on Everand um and so I just picked it but I I knew I was always going to be a little <laughs> about the use of disability and I do think it was a little metaphorical which I don't love um so I think if you were interested in reading it because you were looking for like some rep around like visual like visual impaired protagonists etc I would I, I would I would go elsewhere for that I don't think this is going to give you that um but if you can kind of park the slight ickiness it was perfectly fine I don't particularly recommend it but if it sounds interesting to you by all means pick it up and then the final Euros book I read was Rivers of Babylon by Peter Pistinek which was translated by Peter Petro so many Peters that is practically a She's forgotten the word. What's the word? Tongue twister. Jesus Christ. Um, so this is the first book in a trilogy, actually. Kind of like a literary crime noir. That might make it sound more titillating than it is. It was, right, so this is about a guy. Oh, it's here, by the way. <laughs> here it is. It's a very white cover, so you're gonna get all kinds of glare from the very cloudy day outside. It's July, of course it's raining. Um, Rats, that's his name. Yeah, this follows a guy called Rats who grew up in the countryside 
in Slovakia and moves to the city to try and sort of make his fortune so that he can go back home and marry this girl that he wants to marry but he can't do that until he makes some money because patriarchy and when he gets there he gets a job as a boiler man in a hotel so basically he's in charge of keeping the furnaces going that heat all of the water in the winter Slovakia in the winter gets c -c -c cold so um that's his job and from that he ta he's taken over from this very passionate man who has been running the furnaces there basically his entire working life and he's been doing the job of like four men on his own and um he's very happy to retire and go shack up with this woman from the kitchens that he's had his eye on so rats takes over and over the course of the book becomes sort of a bit of like a crime boss because he sort of realizes when it is cold outside and you are the person with the power to heat a room or not heat a room all of a sudden people give you like money and bribes and things and treat you really nicely to stay on to stay on your good side so that they don't freeze to death in their beds so um parts of it again are quite like farcical but there's some real like uncomfy darkness through the book and on the whole i found it like an interesting read rats is a very like good anti-hero kind of character however my quibble with it other than the treatment of women which i think was purposeful but is still like i just you know don't love to see my gender disrespected um and yeah other than that i so I, I pretty much enjoyed it but my main other quibble was that it really felt like book one of a trilogy in the sense that it felt like set up. It felt like the first installment for a story that is going to happen in the later books. Like it was all build up and I didn't feel like there was much narrative payoff for like this as an individual volume. And I, I didn't enjoy it anywhere near enough to read the next two installments so i now just like i'm like hmm. don't know what happens to rats but i probably will never find out and that is just something that i have made peace with then i have four books that i'm gonna try and rattle through it quite quickly but they're four books that i really liked so <laughs> we'll try and do this in a pacey manner um but these were the four books that i read for my june impatient reading vlog Again, if you are new here, um, reading impatiently is something that I wanted to do this year because I was annoyed and frustrated at myself for like how regularly I would let books that I was really excited about reading sit on my shelves unread while I read, I don't know, 24 European books that n most of them I didn't really love that much because I got it into my head that I should do some kind of silly little reading challenge instead of just reading the books that I was excited to read. Um, I'm not saying I've completely learned my lesson, okay? I'm trying. I am trying to evolve. Um, but yeah, I, I do like to do a vlog every month where I just pick four books that I'm very excited to read that month off my shelf or sometimes off my library's shelf um, and I just read them and there's no other theme to the vlog except these are the four books that I'm excited to read about this month not because they're prize related, not because there's anything else going on just because in my little heart it's the book that I want to read so the four that I picked this month well the first of the four that i picked this month is blackouts by justin torres and this was a book that i was really interested in because i love books that do um fun and cool stuff with layout and have like kind of a mixed media approach which this book had i also bought this book when i was in paris so um i got it stamped by shakespeare and company um so I was really excited to get to this one soon because, you know, I paid I paid Paris a dollar for this book. So, um, and I did, I really enjoyed it. I think I, was it the one? It, mm, 
we're not going to get into ranking them we don't have time um what is this book about stick to the plot Hannah come on what's this book about okay um this is essentially two men speaking to each other in the dark and telling each other stories about their lives which okay it sounds wishy-washy but stick with me so the men are in this room this dark room because uh in a sort of institution convalescence home hospital we don't really know the exterior world of this novel incredibly vague this is this is we're doing interior work here guys okay the outside it's not for us so um Juan is a, an older man and he is very sadly dying in this in this convalescence home and our other character who I don't think we know his name no we don't um the other narrator a uh, protagonist uh, has come to take care of him he's a much younger man and they met once we don't know at the start of the book what their connection was or or why he's gone to take care of him but he has they they previously had crossed paths earlier on in their lives and he's now come to sort of take care of him and just be with him at the end of his life and so it does sound quite morbid and there it is it is sad there's there's morbid stuff in there but it's also really fascinating and kind of very joyful and, and playful at points. Um, they're kind of talking to each other about their lives, their their identities. They're both queer men. They talk to them. They talk to each other about um, being Puerto Rican men. Um, they're both Puerto Rican. They particularly talk about being Puerto Rican gay men, and that was really interesting. And I loved that. I loved the relationship between the two men, that sort of intergenerational relationship um, that particularly for queer men was obviously incredibly disrupted by the AIDS epidemic because there were we lost so many men. I mean, we lost so many people, but particularly lost so many queer men from that um, from those communities that it's it's we're still sort of seeing those gaps in the intergenerational relationships that we have within the queer community and i think that was re really poignant it's not spoken about in the book but it was just something that i was reflecting on as i was reading it and um in and amongst these sort of lovely funny conversations back and forth that, that the two of them are having um, is the story of a, uh, a woman called jan gay who was a sexologist and she uh in in one's in Juan's room there is a a stack of papers that are from a book that she was writing like a thesis she was writing about sex variants essentially about about queer sexualities and, and identities um that was repressed and kind of not released or her work was changed and was never published exactly how she wanted it um, and she was a real person and the, and the studies that she did were, were real studies and the pages in the room we don't quite know how they got into Juan's sort of um, possession but they've been blacked out like that i'm sorry if you keep getting a weird echo i'm i'm trying not to talk too loudly and get excited but i really liked this book um yeah so you get these like blacked out bits but if you look very closely it's not all blacked out and it creates like blackout poetry and they don't know who's done it so there's also like in and amongst these personal histories that it's also a book about sort of um socially how we write ourselves back into narratives that we've been excluded from historically and i yeah i thought it was i thought it was beautiful and wonderful and, and really powerful and then i went on instagram and saw someone dicking on it and was like i have lost respect for you so everyone's entitled to their opinion unless their opinion is wrong um I'm joking obviously everyone is genuinely entitled to their opinion but you know when like something's about like something queer especially um because that's like something that matters a lot to me um and people go oh, I just didn't really see that like the point in it and I'm like 
Yeah, I think I see why you didn't see the point in it. I'm gonna just leave it at that. Then the next book that I read was Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. So this is one of my classics. Uh, this one's from the library, which is why there's a big gay sticker on it. Um, I never know when the library does that, if it's like helpfully signposting to people or if it's like a warning sign. Anyway, um, thank danger this book is gay. Um, this was, yeah, this was an incredibly depressing uh, but wonderful book. So this is a book about David who is a white American man in Paris and he's doing that whole like 1950s American in Paris thing. He's He's gone over there to like experience Europe and kind of find himself and he's just sort of dicking about a bit waiting for his like grown up life to begin. Um, he's like in his mid to late 20s, I think. Um, and he has met a woman there um, and he's asked her to marry him. And she's gone away to Spain to think about whether or not she wants to marry him. And in the time that she is away, David forms, uh, David starts a relationship with a bartender called Giovanni. Um, and they have this very sort of like passionate but difficult relationship because David has an awful lot of internalised homophobia and um, yeah it's not always uh, pleasant or comfortable to read but the the thing that makes this book desperately sad is the way that Baldwin sort of reveals the chronology of what's happened so like the second page in not only do we know that there was a relationship with Giovanni. We also know that that relationship ended badly and we also know that for some reason Giovanni is in prison and facing the a, an execution. So like not only has it like not worked out, it's it's gone badly wrong somewhere. And so you you have that pretty much as as a starting point like pretty much like from the get go. So when you then go back to the beginning and you meet Giovanni for the first time, it's even more heartbreaking and sad and I thought the writing was beautiful I mean James Baldwin's a, James Baldwin is a is a beautiful writer and yeah I, I really enjoyed it and um if you want to see more I have to I have to stop talking about these books so I've already talked about them at length in this other video try and be faster Mama. right okay the next one I read was Private Rights by Julia Armfield which is probably my most hyped release of the year. Um, so this is the story of three sisters, Iris, Isla and Agnes. Oh my god, I, why do they both have I names, honestly? Um, and they are, their father has just died and they were pretty estranged from him and the book on one level is about the sisters being sort of estranged from each other sort of estranged from their dad, trying to work out do should we feel bad if we don't grieve for people that we didn't particularly love. Um, so a lot of it is about their relationships with each other and that is wonderful and Julia Armfield is like exquisitely good, exquisitely good at intimate character studies and portraits of just really real feeling relationships and I thought the relationships between the three sisters were all really clear they all had nuance and sort of personality and real detail and she's wonderful at that um, but the other big thing about this book is that it is set in a near future where climate breakdown has happened or has happened more thoroughly than it has already happened in the present day and uh, it has been raining for about 30 years it stops every so often for a couple of minutes um but that's quite rare and so th it's set in London is it named as being London or have I just assumed it was London I think it is set in London um but obviously it, it's a London that looks very different because there's water fucking everywhere so there's like marshland that w wasn't marshland there's whole areas that are underwater now and they've had to like work out how trains can kind of run on these like bridges and their dad was an architect who made a lot of money building these like fancy floating houses for rich people to live in um and so the way she writes about water which if you have read Our Wives Under the Sea, you will know she's beautiful at writing about water, um, was brilliant. And I thought it was such a brilliant way of doing dystopia 
because it's like it's very it's very present but what's incredible about the book is that there's so much everyday humdrum monotony to it brackets positive um, and it, it's sort of I, I went to a book talk that she did for this book where she was talking about how like she was really taken with this idea that it could be the literal end of the world like climate breakdowns happening the sea levels are rising it hasn't stopped raining raining in 30 years and yet like you know like PR companies still exist and like someone's got to answer their emails and like we've, we're all still going to therapy and like it's like just like this idea that um, you think you will notice when the end of the world has begun and yet actually most of us don't and that was really interesting so that's all really positive I did have a couple of problems with this book well I think I had one problem with this book that stopped me loving it and that was the story pacing. I thought I thought the characters were brilliant and the relationships were brilliant and the setup and the world and the themes that she's exploring and the questions that she was asking. I loved all of that. I just, I felt like the story was a bit, I don't wanna say lacking because there is, there is real story there. It's just the way it paces out. Watch the vlog if you wanna know more. Um, still really rate it but for me doesn't doesn't be our oh, wives under the sea oh and all the sisters are gay and then the fourth and final book i read and i think this one was actually my favorite this is grief is the thing with feathers which i have been saying grief is a thing with feathers in like all the whole of that vlog where i was talking about it and uh, i only just yesterday looked at the cover and was like that says the welcome to my reading channel <clears throat> so this is a book that is again another very experimental one and an audacious debut oh my god i can't believe this was a debut novel um but yeah this is about a man called dad uh who has lost his wife she's she's passed away recently and it is the immediate aftermath and then the more long-term aftermath of um, her loss and the way that he is grieving for her and the, he's a Ted Hughes scholar and he's writing a book about Ted, Ted Hughes's Crow, the collection Crow, which we'll get to later. Um, and he has visited him and his sons, there's two, two sons who also we hear from in the book, um, Crow visits their home to sort of a, a physical a physical manifestation of Crow or metaphysical manifestation of Crow I don't know what the correct terminology actually is here Crow comes to the house and uh, just to almost like psychopomp them through their grief um, and it was I'm, I'm, I'm so conscious that that makes it sound really bizarre and it is odd and part of what makes it a wonderful book is that it is quite avant-garde, it's quite playful, it's quite esoteric and it's quite intellectual in ways that I probably didn't access because when I read this book I had not read Crow by Ted Hughes and I actually think that was a good thing because it meant I wasn't, I wasn't over intellectualising the book, even if it was written to be intellectualized. I didn't do that because I hadn't read the book and I actually think what you get then on a read is just full access with no like distraction from the incredibly beautiful and raw human emotion of this book without sort of trying to like work it out and I actually think that's a really nice way to read it so I suggest you do like me and read Crow after reading Grief is a Thing with Feathers. Um, but yeah, I think this was the, my favourite of the books that I read. Maybe the favourite, my favourite book that I read this month. I think it probably was. I'm, I feel like I'm talking about it not articulately, um, which is normally a sign that I really liked a book. It's the reason I can never bloody talk about Ali Smith ever. Um, so just know from me that if I've got a very well crafted review that feels like I've really thought about it, it's probably not a favourite book and if I sound like I'm rattling on about nonsense it probably means I loved it. Um, this was great and it made me cry. 
the end. And then because I read Grief is the Thing with Feathers, I happened to be on a train journey. I finished that on a train journey. Um, and I thought uh, if I sat with the feeling of that book for too long, I would cry in public, which I'm not loath to do. I cry in public quite often, but um, you know, I wasn't feeling it that day. It was sunny. Um, so I thought, huh, I wonder if I can get the, if I can get access to Crow on my phone and Everand have the audio of Crow by Ted Hughes, which is read by Ted Hughes. So I decided to listen to it on audio. And um, this is sort of an experimental poem that Ted Hughes wrote in like the barren period he had, or his, he self-described it as the barren period he had in his writing after the death of Sylvia Plath. We do not have time to get into Plath and Hughes, but Team Sylvia. And the, the full title of the poem, talk, is it? Is it a continuous? Well, I don't know if it's a continuous poem or a collection of poems because I listened on audio and it felt like it kind of ran through for me, but I think they are like short poems that are very heavily interlinked. Anyway, um, the subtitle is uh, The Life and is From the Life and Songs of the Crow. And they're poems that were originally going to be part of like a wider, more ambitious, I think, novel that he was going to write and then um, ended up not writing. And so he published Crow as this like shorter collection of poems. And it's a it's a sort of history of humanity, sort of <sighs> filleting of the catholic church or christianity in general actually and there's a th yeah it's <laughs> god <sighs> what i will say is i enjoyed the read the reading experience listening to this i thought it was especially cool that ted hughes read it like that um this is a, a collection of poems that has been heavily debated by like actual critics and academics and I don't think me listening to it was the best format for me to critically engage in that way with it. So what I would say is if you want to know what Crow's really all about, Google it. Google it. Because I'm not going to be able to tell you. But I will say that it's essentially it's like a history of mankind, as I said, where Crow exists, sort of, is there alongside God for the journey. And Crow's got, in my reading, strong low-key vibes, okay? He's a bit of a trickster. He's a bit of a foil uh, for God and also for humanity. But he also has accidentally, and sometimes on purpose, um, a, a huge hand in the development of people and life. I don't fucking know, man. I probably will get it out from the library and read it properly at some point. At some point. And then maybe we might be able to have a clever chat about it. But I enjoyed it. I don't really remember it. But I do remember Grief is the Thing with Feathers. Okay, so then last book from my these are going to be in videos or have been in videos um, is The Talented Mr. Ripley. This is going to be in a video that's going to be coming up on my channel because my best friend Farmer and I are doing a book to screen video where we read this and then watch the new Ripley adaptation that's on Netflix. So not the film from like the early noughties, um, the new one with Andrew Scott. So I'm not going to talk about this too much here. I know I keep saying that and then I keep talking for ages, but I'm really not going to talk too much about this. This is about Tom Ripley, who is a sort of um, young, ambitious grifter, kind of, in New York, kind of a chancer, and uh, he happens upon this opportunity to be paid by this incredibly wealthy man to go and find his son, or go and bring his son back, who is having far too much fun in Europe and needs to come back and like start taking himself seriously and become the like heir to the company. And the and the reason that Tom is approached for this is because the dad has heard that like he 
that he's friends with Dickie, even though they actually just sort of like met each other like one time. So anyway, Tom's not gonna say no to a free ride to Europe. So he's like, sure, I'll go get Dickie, no probs. Um, but then when he gets there, he becomes quite enamored with this life that Dickie is leading and then plot happens. So that's that one. I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was really good. It's the first in a series. I will probably continue the series on and off. I'm not like in a mad rush to, to get to the next installment of this. I liked it. I didn't like it as much as Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith, which is the first book of hers that I read last year. And I can link a reading block down below where I read that one because that book I really, really loved. So that's Ripley. More on Ripley coming soon. And then let us stick with the fiction before we get into the non-fiction, shall we? So I listened to The Day of the Dead by Nikki French, which is narrated by Beth Chalmers, which is the actual end of the Frida Klein series. Not when I said in May or June, no, this is June's book, so I must have said it in May, oh, I finished, I finished book seven, like what a great ending. And then someone very sweetly had to like comment being like, sweetheart, there's another book. <laughs> so thank you for telling me, because I genuinely thought that the series had ended and I'd finished it and I definitely hadn't. Um, this is an interesting one because I remember thinking this was a good ending to the series, which, I mean, if you've been on my channel before, you would have heard me talk about these books. Um, they are a crime series um, about Frida Klein, who is a psychoanalyst, who sort of reluctantly ends up working with the police sometimes, and it's a whole series. Um, the first few in the series are, they're all linked, but they're a bit more episodic, and then as you get towards the end of the series, it becomes like much more, the the books become much less able to be read as a as a standalone if that makes sense um and i remember liking this and i remember thinking that's a good ending i can't fucking remember i can't remember what happens it's it's completely gone and i think it's because i was enjoying it so much that i listened to it i think i listened to it really quickly and I always feel like, particularly with an audiobook, when I race through it, I mean, nothing stays in this sieve for very long anyway, but like, this book is well and truly gone. I think it was like the second book that I read this month. So it was probably like a good 30 days since I finished reading it, but yeah, her plot retention, really not good, really not good. Um, so that was the Day of the Dead. I probably really liked it. Um, and then the final novel that I read this month was Bellies by Nicola Dinan. Um, this is a sort of romance literary um, sort of coming of age book. And I picked it up because ever since I read Sunburn and it ruined my life, this is Sunburn by um, Chloe Michelle Harth, um, I've been hankering for another queer literary romance book that's going to emotionally devastate me. Um, this wasn't quite that. This wasn't quite that. So this follows um, Tom and Ming, um, and it starts when they meet at university and begin dating. And then after they've been together for a few years, Ming, who um, has been presenting as a as cisgendered male, um, comes out as trans and begins the process of um, begins the process of transitioning and Tom is uh, Tom is a gay man. Tom's not bi or pan, he's he's a gay man. And I thought it was really interesting to explore what transition looked like for them and for their relationship and the impact that had on their relationship when Tom really loves Ming but is no longer physically attracted to her body as she transitions. And there's not a lot that he can do about that because physical attraction is physical attraction. Um, and I think that was really interesting. I also really enjoyed the cultural interplay that there was here. Um, Ming is Malaysian, Nicole, uh, Nicola Dinan is also Malaysian. And um, there was a lot of kind of like crossover, um, looking at the kind of like different um, cultural perspectives 
on on queer things which i thought was interesting and also the food descriptions in this book were great i was really here for that so i thought the themes were interesting but for me there were a couple of issues in that at first it started i i nearly dnf'd it because it was feeling quite ya and i don't do very well with ya heartstopper is my big exception and the moon riders randomly by Teresa tomlinson but i think that's just because i read it when i was a ya um anyway um i don't do very well with ya i don't really like enjoy it it's not my favorite thing to read um, and I think that it did get better in terms of that because they got older, but I think I also had a problem with the pacing of it because you flip between their perspectives, you get per first person perspectives from both Tom and Ming throughout the book, um, but it, they're not very evenly weighted, so you'll get like ch like three or four chapters from Tom's perspective, then a couple from Ming, and then you'll get one from Tom, and then you'll go back for a few for, for Ming, and the time passes quite a lot of time passes in this book but it's not always clear how much and that didn't kind of really work for me I always felt like I was getting a bit like um like I was tripping up a little bit in the chronology even though it's not it's not a complex chronology it's like a start to finish kind of thing um but yeah I just kind of was like is this like a month later six months later mm. um and then I increasingly found both Tom and Ming really annoying <laughs> I found them really annoying and I, I desperately didn't want to I really wanted to like them and I just and that you know that's just that's an incredibly personal incredibly personal thing to do with you know probably my own baggage but um yeah I it stopped me from from really enjoying this um but I do think if the theme sound interesting to you give it give it a go I thought it was like well written I I the writing didn't blow me away um but if yeah if you think the story sounds interesting to you then do give it a go it just there were a few personal reasons that it didn't really work for me but always want to like wrap a book that's like by a trans author about trans stuff you know what i mean um that brings us on to the non-fiction portion of the evening well day afternoon what time is it what time what time do you watch youtube videos I'm normally like uh, while I'm cooking. So, are you eating right now? What are you eating? Are you making dinner? What are you making? I really like food. <laughs> okay. So first up with nonfiction, I actually listened to three gay memoirs. <laughs> so um, actually, all of all of my nonfiction is queer. Isn't that nice? Um, I haven't been reading a lot of non-fiction, actually. Um, so I was making a conscious effort this, this month to try and um, up my non-fiction amount. And I do, tend to, I do tend to gravitate towards memoir if I'm doing non-fiction. But um, yeah, let's talk about them. So the first one was A Bookshop of One's Own by Jane Chomley. And this, I, I really enjoyed this one. So this is a memoir by Jane Chumley and it's read by by the author um but it's really more the memoir of a bookshop there was a bookshop called Silver Moon in London for um a few decades I think I think it opened in like the six I want to say like it opened in the 60s and then or 70s and then closed in like the early 2000s I think I think I should know this I read the bloody book but anyway that sort of detail doesn't stay in my head sorry um but Silver Moon was a women's bookshop and a queer owned bookshop. Um, and so the book takes you from like how, how and why they wanted to set up the bookshop, like how they did it. Um, it's various iterations through the life of the bookshop and then really sadly how and why the bookshop closed. Um, and Jane ran it with her, um, at the time her partner, um, and then they actually separated, like they were together for a really long time, but they separated partway through the life of the bookshop, but then carried on working, carried on working together. Um, and it is, it is mostly about the bookshop, although you do obviously still get like parts of Jane's own life and it begins more with, which I think is understandable, like more of like personal memoir for her around, um, 
discovering her own queerness and 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 the importance that that she found in finding like women's spaces and queer spaces where she could express herself and and feel comfortable and but also just where she could find books about women things and about gay things because at, at the time that they opened silver moon there were not a lot of bookshops you know this was pre-internet where you could like buy books like about anything and then get them shipped to your door this was you know if if it wasn't in your local bookshop and you weren't comfortable asking your bookseller to buy the book in for you you wouldn't know and even how would you even know what books were out there <sighs> boggles the mind man i love the internet um but yeah so it's it's, a, it's about the life of the bookshop and the the various things they 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 did to to try and keep it alive for as long as they did and it is a really desperately sad and important sort of reminder of just how important independent bookshops are not only to our, our literary worlds and, and, and societies but to our kind of to our communities and how important safe spaces um and how fiercely we have to kind of advocate for that um the right kind of safe space though let's not get turfy um but yeah i i thought it was really i thought it was really lovely um and if you are at all interested in kind of bookshops running bookshops um and things like that then i do i do recommend it um it made me very very sad that i never i never went to silver moon and now it's and now it's gone forever and it was on Charing Cross Road, so like uh, a really, a really important like booky place. But yeah, so I do, I recommend that. And that was actually recommended to me by my friend Helen. So thanks, Helen. Uh, and then the next book I read was My Autobiography of Carson McCullens by Jen Shapland. So one of you recommended me this uh, because I, for my impatient reading blog last month, I read The Member of the Wedding by Carson McCullers, which is the second book by Carson McCullers I read, and the second book by her that I have loved. Um, and someone said, oh, you should read My Autobiography of Carson McCullers by Jen Shapland. So I went on to Everand and there it was, available as audio. So I thought, great, I will uh, I will read that book that someone recommended to me. And um, I really liked it. It was quite a, it was quite a unique memoir because, and I think the title is actually perfect um, for the themes that they're exploring. So, so Jen Chapland first came across Carson McCullers um, when she was working as an archivist and um, had come across some kind of letters that Carson McCullers had, had written um, and became very interested in her because in the letters um, it was quite clear or, or quite strongly implied that Carson was queer and yet Jen had not kind of like heard about uh, Carson McCullers being um, being a queer woman at all. So Carson McCullers was writing in like the fifties and sixties. Uh, she died in nineteen sixty seven, um, but she died she died quite young. Um, and she did have relationships with men. She was she had an on off marriage where she um, they like got married and then divorced and then married again and then I think divorced again. Um, but Carson McCullers also had a series of, well, well, this is what the book's about, um, flirtations, obsessions, relationships with a number of women, a number of queer women throughout her life. And yet Jen, what Jen Chaplin was really interested in is how that queerness, that sort of quite strong queerness because Carson McCullers never shied away from telling people that like oh my god I'm in love with this woman and everyone was like oh like she's your best friend um, <laughs> and uh yeah so Jen Chaplin was like it's nuts to me that that no one knows about this so she was like well I'm gonna research it because it doesn't look like anyone else has has researched about this um but there wasn't tons for her to research so she ends up doing much more of a subjective sort of exploration or excavation of, of what she can of Carson McCullers and as she's doing that she's talking about what I liked about it was that it it made clear 
and she was very explicit about how subjective the process of writing about anyone who isn't you is. So like it is impossible to do like an objective autobiography of anyone. They're always going to be subjective. Um, and Jen Chaplin really leans into this. So she puts an awful lot of herself and her own sort of memoir and her own life into the book as she's talking about um, researching more about Carson's, more about Carson's life. And um, they have quite a lot in common, um, not just that they're both queer women um, or in Carson's case, I guess, women who exhibit queer behaviours, if you're going to be really like, you can't tell us how she defined. Um, but not only that, but also, so Carson, as I said, died quite young. Um, but she had had a number of strokes in her life, which had left her with um, quite a lot of like pain and chronic um, illness and a lot of like fatigue and things like that. And Jen Shapland also um, suffers with chronic illness. And so she also kind of felt like a lot of kinship with her about that. So there's a lot where she's like reflecting on Carson's life and she's also reflecting on her own life. And Jen Chapman does do, she is able to uncover like a fair amount about these pretty well established, it seems to be by people who actually knew Carson, that yes, these were sapphic relationships that Carson was having. Um, but that for some reason, and I don't think we have to like puzzle out what that reason is, um, but for some reason, uh, those um, sort of aspects of her identity have been sort of squashed in academia and in kind of reporting and in how we sp speak about her, because she's really only quite recently been sort of reclaimed as a queer writer, despite, as I said, she died in 1967. Um, and certainly like, the first time I read The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, which was maybe about five or six years ago, I didn't know that Carson McGullis was a queer author at all. So, so that's really, that's kind of interesting and frustrating to, to read about that. And yeah, I thought, I thought this was interesting. I do think like structurally the book trod over the same ground quite a lot. Um, and if I'm being incredibly nitpicky, if, and I'm being really nitpicky here, but I think it's partly because I read this book later, which we're going to talk about. Uh, but I was reading that at the same time as this, which is all about the hidden history of bisexuality. And it, I, I just find, as a bisexual, I was getting kind of annoyed at Jen Chaplin. So this is incredibly, like, subjective, personal of me. But that she kept referring to Carson as a lesbian, or assuming that she was a lesbian, and not assuming that she might have been bisexual when it is documented that she also had relationships with men. And that started to get on my nerves. <laughs> she was she was she was using lesbian quite broadly, but I just thought it was slightly ironic. Slightly ironic in a book that was about the erasure of identities. <laughs> that like she didn't even consider for a second that Carson was actually bisexual. But that's by the by. That's by the by. It didn't it didn't it stopped my personal enjoyment at certain points of the book. It doesn't make it a bad book. It doesn't make her a bad writer. I just, it was something that was playing on my mind as I was reading it. Anyway, so that was my autobiography of Carson McCullers. And then the last memoir I read was None of the Above, Reflections on Life Beyond the Binary by Travis Alabanza. So this is a memoir by Travis about um, their life growing up in sort of discovering or realising um, that they were gender non-conforming and that the sort of various um, internal conversations that they have had with themselves as a as a result of that and what was really interesting for me was um, the the way Travis spoke about um, well firstly the way their racial identity linked with their sort of gender identity um, and how frustrated they were that often people would want them to kind of pull apart those two aspects of their identity and talk about them separately as if they had no conversation with each other so I thought that was really interesting and also um, that 
they, for a long time, they were gender non-conforming in a very sort of um, embracing both binary genders, if you see what I mean, or like embracing a lot of femininity and a lot of masculinity and very proudly, you know, wearing like skirts, but having hairy legs or having a full face of makeup and a beard and things like that. But that as they kind of got older, they found themselves sort of thinking more about um, different kinds of gender affirming treatments, like uh, more feminizing treatments and being worried or concerned about what that meant about their gender identity and if they could truly be non-binary if they were seeking to feminize their appearance and then the knots that they would tie themselves in trying to figure that out and also the sort of like in lots of ways the the emotional labor that you pay when you are trying so hard to articulate yourself so that other people can understand you in a way that makes you feel seen but that how often the process of trying to do that can get in the way of you just being um and i and i thought that was yeah that was really well handled really well handled in the book so if, if you're if you're after a, if you're after um a memoir in that sort of vein I recommend it, I thought it was good. Um, I also liked that um, they repeat the chapter titles a lot in the chapters. There's only about eight chapters, which in an audiobook that was like, I can't remember exactly how long this one was, but it was like over eight hours. Um, that's quite long, you know, and you've got those like hour long chapters in an audiobook. And I really liked that they kept repeating the like theme of the chapter and the like phrasing of the chapter throughout it because it meant that I always knew where I was, even if I'd paused mid chapter and had to pick it up again later. So just personally, I really appreciated that as an audiobook experience. And then yes, the final book that I read was by the Hidden Culture, Science and History of Bisexuality. I got science and history the wrong way around, but never mind. by Dr. Julia Shaw. And this is pretty much what it sounds like. This book has been on my shelf since it came out. I got it in 2022. And I think I got it when it had just been released. And I hadn't read it yet. And now I have. And I'm glad that I have because like as a, as a bisexual woman who's in a long term relationship with a man, I felt incredibly seen by this book because I get read as straight all the time. And it really annoys me. And then I get annoyed at myself for how much it annoys me. And like, just, I felt so seen by this book. I felt so seen by this book. And I'm so grateful that Julia Shaw wrote it. But it is, it is pretty much what it says. And even though that sounds like quite a heavy title, it's, it's actually incredibly readable. There's some difficult stuff in here. Um, but um, it's only just over 200 pages. The chapters are all pretty short and they're all kind of like split out with like subheadings so it's really like accessible and really like easy to kind of get into and Julia Shaw wrote it she says in the introduction like largely because she she couldn't find a book that pulled together the very disparate and quite limited research that had been done into bisexuality no one had kind of pulled it together into one place so she said right well i'm gonna pull it together into one place then um so this is i think like designed to be like a starting point or like an overview and then there's like other places that you can go if you want to like read more about specific aspects of it so it doesn't go into like tons and tons and tons of detail in terms of like each individual element that she's exploring but it's a really good overview and yeah i i enjoyed it I enjoyed it and I'm glad she wrote it. So, them's the books. Let me know if you've read any of these. Let me know what your favorite books that you read this month were. And if you've enjoyed this video, if you could give it a little thumbs up so that the algorithm knows you liked it, that would be really helpful. That's all from me and you will see me next week for, I can't decide if I'm gonna split out my best books of the year and my mid-year check-in, like mid-year freak out book tag.
maybe let me know let me know in a comment down below if you would have prefer like one longer video that's got like the best books i've read this year the mid-year freak out tag and just like general updates on like goals and stuff for mid-year in one or do you want those split into two videos what would be best for you let me know i'm here to do your bidding